Welcome, everyone. I am so excited to introduce you this morning to our performer, international flutist, Adam Sadbury, uh, who's accompanied by our own Dr. Jenny Gann. Uh, and many, many thanks to Dr. Gann for helping to organize this collaboration, really being the energy that made this happen. Uh, so today's presentation is this year's Transforming the South Lecture, which is one of the college's premier endowed lecture series. It is worth noting, as we begin, that as a part of Wesleyan's commitment to investigating our past, as we seek to be more equitable in the present, for the sake of more just future, this series has been renamed. So this is a new name for the lecture series, only in its second year. The funds and the original name for the series came from someone who worked actively to bolster white supremacy and anti-black racism. So it's important to remember that, and it's important to know that changing a name does not erase that history, but we have a chance to think anew about what transformations are necessary in our narratives and our ways of being. So this morning, we have a chance uh, to transform also the lecture. Uh, we don't just learn through words. Um, we have a chance to transform the lecture by bringing together music, and articles from the Tri-State Defender, of which Adam Sandberry's late grandfather, L. Alex Wilson, served as editor. Wilson was one of the unsung heroes of the civil rights movement, and Adam continues his journalistic legacy through what he calls musical journalism. That is, Sandberry is committed to expanding the black diaspora, promoting equity, representation, music education, and commissioning music that tells the story of the Black Diaspora. He is currently the acting principal flutist in the Memphis Symphony Orchestra and has performed as a principal uh, flutist for the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra, Des Moines, Detroit Symphony Orchestra, has performed in Minnesota, Albany, Omaha, Sphinx Symphony Orchestra, and the New World Symphony. So he's uh, been around the world, performed uh, many places, and it's a wonderful opportunity that we have here today. So I introduce you to Adam with musical journalism, continuing the legacy with the flute. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, it is a true pleasure to be here with you all today. Uh, in this this, uh, this week, really. Uh, I've been kind of welcomed so kindly to a campus uh, before, so um, I like you all. Uh, I'd like to come back to some points. But um, anyway, yes, this is actually the very first time that I've gotten to do this presentation, so this is very exciting for me and maybe slightly nerve-wracking, so I'm sorry if I talk more quickly than I should. Uh, I'll try to calm myself down, but uh, this is very, very important to me because my grandfather is a true hero, and I want to make sure that people know who he is and that I uh, have the opportunity to um, continue his work in the best way that I can. So without further ado, I will take this into my hand. So um, context, this is going to be a pretty heavy presentation, just so, you, so you're aware. So uh, if this is a time in which you don't feel like you can handle taking on a lot of emotional weight, this might be difficult for you, so take that as you will, um, but this is all very important information that's very relevant for now and forever, so um, keep that in mind. So who am I? Um, I was just given a wonderful introduction, um, but just a little bit more. Uh, I identify as a black American, uh, man, flutist, educator, roller skater, Alexander Technique student. Uh, this feels like a weird LinkedIn dating profile, and I'm sorry for that. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm trying to live a multifaceted life uh, because only a few, a few years ago, the only thing that I really enjoyed doing was just flute and maybe some video games on the side, but uh, life is great, so I'm trying to do more of that. And, um, yeah, I don't have to say too much more. So, my grandfather, L. Alex Wilson, he was born in Ocala, Florida, and uh, eventually made his way to Memphis where he became the editor and general manager of the Tri-State Defender in the mid-50s. And he was the first editor there, actually, and was planted there directly by the Chicago Defender, which is the most prominent black newspaper in the country. So he was already seen as uh, someone who was going to make a lot of changes. And as you will see throughout the presentation, he really, really did. So um, major stories that he covered included 
the lynching of Emmett Hill, Montgomery bus boycott, and the desegregation of Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. He was there. Arkansas should be AR. I apologize, ignore that, y'all. Um, <laughs> but he was there at all three of those events. There are, there's footage of him, and um, in this next slide, you will see the video that I was able to put together with a cousin of mine. The audio you hear is um, a lot of my voice and things that he was able to find through a lot of his amazing audio engineering and visual experience, and it will give you a good encapsulation of the gravity of his work and exactly what he experienced. And as I said before, this uh, video or this entire presentation is heavy, so there is violence in this next video that you will witness. So be prepared and um, please also enjoy. We want you to hear a story by one of our own. Our new principal flute, acting principal flute of the Memphis Symphony Orchestra is Adam Sadbury. L. Alex Wilson was the lot of editor and general manager of the Tri-State Defender, one of Memphis's black newspapers. Through his seemingly boundless desire to provide black Memphians with the information they needed, he worked 80 hour weeks and covered major stories on events including the Memphis bus boycott, the lynching of Emmett Till, and the Little Rock Nine, the last which stamped L. Alex Wilson's name into history. On September 23rd, 1957, the desegregation of Central High School marked the beginning of strides made through Brown versus Board of Education, and 49-year-old L. Alex Wilson was there to document the story with his team. Black journalists were conditioned to expect the worst while working, but this was a particularly dangerous situation. So the day that they were actually supposed to go into the school, uh, there were four of us uh, who went up together. As myself, L. Alex Wilson, who had been my boss at the Afro Uh and uh, there was Jimmy Hicks, who was at the time at the Amsterdam News in New York. And Jimmy and I covered a lot of stories down south together. Uh, and there was a commercial photographer who was along. And as we approached the street that runs in front of the school there, they had this big mob there. And uh, <clears throat> they, they confronted us. And of course, we pulled out our press credentials and that sort of thing, tell them who we were the press. And that didn't cut it much at all. Both the Army and the National Guard were involved because a large mob was expected. Approximately 1,000 white people arrived to display their outrage at nine black students claiming an education that all people deserved. The moment that L. Alex Wilson and his team arrived on the streets of Little Rock, the angry mob turned their attention from the students to the journalists, immediately proceeding to call them the N-word and attack them. We just got a report here on this end that the students are here. KKK on one occasion, he was teaching school down there. 
and he had to run. And after that, uh, I think he felt shame of himself, and he decided that he would never run again in a situation like that. So he stayed back. You know, he just walked down, and they, they beat him something awful, you know. They were striking him, they were kicking him, they were throwing stuff and hitting him. And uh, of course his family, he died a couple of years later, and his family thought that some of the head damage he suffered there uh, was related to his death. L. Alex Wilson's severing ended up being a grace for the nine students that allowed them to silently enter the school while the mob was distracted, officially desegregating Central High School. The day following the events of the school, newspapers nationwide featured front page articles and pictures of L. Alex Wilson in Little Rock. He was the face of courage, drive, tenacity, stoicism, and fearlessness that would not run in the face of hate. If society can learn anything from L. Alex Wilson, it is that running from adversity and discomfort will get society nowhere. Great change only comes with great action and sacrifice. One does not necessarily need to sacrifice their body for the cause, but one must sacrifice their peace and complacency if they ever hope to see this country function as a genuine whole. If L. Alex Wilson, my grandfather, was still alive today, he would surely agree. happened because we've gotten 
so much great art and inspiration from people like Langston Hughes and Bob William Brazil and many, many other people, including Sergeant Johnson, who is an artist who inspired William Grant Still to write Mother and Child. His, uh, his legacy, Sergeant Johnson's, was of course his work, but largely his relationship with his mother. His father passed away when he was quite young, and that inspired him to, to write many, many works that took on the title Mother and Child, likely to help him reconnect with his sense of family. And you can see a few of those works, Mother and Child, here. You can see that they're quite simple but beautiful. And you know, all of them embrace, have the mother embracing the child in some way or another. You know, the first one is a drawing, and now we have a statue where the two figures are melded together in unity. And here with the child on the mother's back. Mother and child is an archetype that's been around forever, and I think the original one is Ma uh, Mother Mary and Jesus, so it all comes back to religious roots as well. And within the music itself, Mother and Child, you can really hear this relationship that he's highlighting. There is a two-note motive that appears right from the very first line of the piece. And if you read music, uh, it's you know, G sharp, F sharp, which is a whole step, and will change notes throughout the piece. And in the bottom line, you can see something similar, but slightly, slightly more elaborate. And I'll play it for you now so we can get a sense of what it actually sounds like. Unfortunately. 
In this slide, you can see an article that I took directly from this Tri-State Defender of pictures from the funeral. You can see Mamie herself grieving over her son. And um, she decided to make this an open casket funeral because she wanted to make sure that the world knew what happened to her son. She wanted to make sure that the world was aware of exactly the, uh, the amount of pain and hatred and torment that can go on for you know, whatever internal reasons are going on, but she needed the world to understand what was going on. And, um, you can see in the bottom right of this picture, her leaning on a family member and reading condolence letters that were sent to her, because these images here were not only in the Tri-State Defender, but in newspapers all over the country and internationally as well. And one of the images that is included in the newspapers is an actual picture of Emmett Till after the lynching inside of that open casket. And I have included it in the next slide of this so you can understand the full context. If you don't wanna look, close your eyes for like 10 seconds or something, but it's very important, I think, for everyone to understand what the results of the um, final scene experience were. He was, um, after the actual after, I, I know exactly what, but I'm not going to say exactly what, she, we, need, we don't need to go into that much detail, but he was um, at the very end thrown into a river, which is why it's so hard to see and understand his face here. Uh, he was there for a few days, I believe. So, the aftermath of this incident. Emmett Till's murderers at the time were ruled not guilty by an all-white jury which is unfortunately not a surprise for the time. Um, and later on, after they were guaranteed that they would be safe, they admitted to the crimes. And after that, Emma Till's mother decided that it was time for her to take uh, action into her own hands. She was not going to sit on the sidelines and allow this to happen to anybody else if she could do anything about it. So she became an activist and got multiple degrees and taught in the public schools and traveled the country sharing his story and the tragedy and violence of lynching and generally ensuring that people saw and understood. And very, very recently, um, less than a week ago, the Immitil Anti-Lynching Act was signed into law by President Biden. So, um, you know, better late than never. And it's, it's, it's very important to so it's, it's And um, hopefully we have more things like this, people realizing that history still has so many more things that need to be addressed and handled. So, more connections between mother and child and Emmett Till. I mentioned the mother and child archetype earlier, and the versions that are presented within the music versus Emma Till's stories are quite different. The music can be interpreted however you want to, but of course, history is history, and the polarization is what makes what you'll hear in the music so powerful. And um, whenever I play it, or whenever Jenny and I play it, I hope that you keep and Ms. Hill in your mind, and any other mother-child relations you have, maybe with your own mothers or motherly figures. And um, William Brent Still was not the, or sorry, Emmett Till was not the only person to lose his father when he was young. William Brent Still also did. And because of history and the way the world works right now, they're both significantly more famous than they were during their own lifetimes. William Brent Still, of course, being famous already, but because of the resurgence of black musicians uh, or black composers, or uh, awareness of them at least, he is uh, basically at the top of uh, a lot of the lists of black composers to play. And the last thing, of course, is that their lives and stories were largely shaped by their relationships with their mothers. So shout out to all the moms out there. And finally, uh, Chenny and I will now play mother and child with all of this
second story. I promise there are not any more than that, so I don't have to worry about <laughs> too many more emotions. Um, so this is Valerie Coleman, a phenomenal black flutist, composer, entrepreneur, teacher, chamber musician. Uh, I personally know her, and part of the reason why I'm here is because she was one of the judges for the Concert Artist Guild competition that I was a winner of last year. So I'm, uh, in I'm partially indebted to her and just very thankful. Thank you very much. <laughs> she is a professor of flute and composition at the Manus School of Music in New York City and has taught at basically every major conservatory as a master class teacher and clinician. And she's also a co-founder and former member of the Imani Wins, a twice Grammy nominee. Uh, twice Grammy nominated wind quintet, uh, and a wind quintet is an ensemble that has flute, clarinet, oboe, bassoon, and French horn, just so you know. And part of the reason why they were so incredible is because they helped expand the classical music repertoire and the idea of classical music. The word classical is quite outdated, in my opinion. It's, uh, it hardly represents what music is because I mean, what is classic? Who decides what classic is? Uh, that's, that's a whole other conversation, but um, she has been an innovator since her birth, honestly. It's, it's from everything that I've heard about her. Her piece, Wish Sonatine, which Jenny and I will play, is a depiction of the Middle Passage. Uh, it's a part of the trans transatlantic slave trade, and specifically the selling, trading, and transporting of enslaved Africans from Africa to the New World, and it's based on a poem called Wish by Fred uh, Diagoire, which is in the next slide, so I will read it to you. And it uses motifs that represent very specific moods and actions. And a motif, if you do not know, is essentially just um, some type of small musical symbol or recurring idea that helps to get um, ideas and stories across in music. So the poem, Wish. <laughs> I wish those tall ships in Af at Africa's shore had dropped anchor to plant crops there, sugarcane, tobacco, cotton, and coffee. Instead, they filled the hungry bellies of hulls with Africans and set sail, wanting nothing from that big place. That wasn't diamond, gold, ivory, flesh. I wind the clocks back and turn the ships around, not a single bullet, whip, or cutlass. Sound to deafen our ears for centuries. No Atlantic road of bones from people dumped in the sea to form a wake. This poem is a direct reflection of the music, and if you listen really closely, you, you can feel this depiction. And um, the very first thing that you hear in the music is a sort of horn call, and we'll get it when we get there. But um, these are two of the main motifs that you hear in the music, the literal whip, and the djembe drum, also known as the talking drum. And you can see a picture of one up there, and uh, I will play them so you, can get, so you can get a sense of what they sound like, so we can pick them up whenever we perform. So the three whips sound like this. exactly what makes the jumbe drum so powerful because it can take something so simple and morph it just by um, ch changing the way you hold the drum or by striking it on a different place and also the amount of force you put on it. It's, uh, it's an extremely flexible and powerful instrument. And the last motif that you will hear um, will be played by Jenny here. And uh, this is the sound of inner contemplation which occurs whenever the Africans on board the ship are trying to figure out what to do, what their life will be, and what is coming.
wish zone it's in and its history, we can get into something on the far opposite side of experiences and feelings. So the March on Washington, one of the most powerful and pivotal events in history, it's uh, something I get chills about every time I even see this light in all honesty. And uh, again, these newspapers, these newspaper snippets are from this Tri-State Defender, the newspaper that my grandfather wrote for. I found them all in an archive at a library that's in Memphis, and I uh, had a lot of fun and uh, a lot of emotional experiences kind of re-going re through what he went through and what so many other people in history did. And, uh, before I go to the next slide, you can just see the kind of, I'm sorry these aren't the clearest, but you can kind of see in the second picture the mass of people that are there uh, at, at Washington. There are about 250,000 people that were at that event. So the purpose of the March on Washington was to address the conditions under which most black Americans were living at the time and to facilitate meaningful civil rights laws, a massive federal works program, full and fair employment, housing, the right to vote, and adequate integrated education. People went from all over the world, and you can see people here from Memphis with their signs, and um, actually some smiling faces, some a little bit more stern, and um, you know, this was a, a really interesting thing to be a part of because this was a moment that was going to change the world forever. And one of the great things about the March in Washington is that it included many speakers and performers to help humanize the event and to help uh, spread awareness of it. And those people included greats like Mahalia Jackson, Bob Dylan, Joan Baez, and Martin Luther King, who gave his famous I Have a Dream speech there. And one important thing to note is that, you know, not, not only were there black musicians, there were white, there were white musicians, uh, everybody was involved in making sure that humanity was represented at this event. So this is an excerpt from the Tri-State Defender that digs into the pathos uh, behind why black Americans and so many people wanted this to happen. And I don't think I have quite enough time to read it to you, but essentially it gets into the fact that this has been coming for a very, very long time. And that the waiting needs to have some type of resolution. There needs to be some type of result, and this was one of them. These here are two excerpts of conservative conservatives talking about their reactions to the March on Washington. Uh, please read them while I'm while I'm talking. Uh, listen to both if you can. But essentially, everybody, both in America and internationally, were totally blown away by the power and poise and dignity that was displayed at this event because it was totally nonviolence as Martin Luther King and many of the organizers of this event wanted. And it was a true testament to the epitome of humanity. And, um, there are very few things that get you know, staunch conservatives to say, what, what was the one that I liked so much? Um, <clears throat> I'll just read the first paragraph from the first one. My basic conclusion, on first glance at the March proposal, was that it would be a dangerous, useless, overdrawn, self-defeating, overdramatized, petulant mob expression that would do neither Negroes nor Americans any good. Maybe I'm still not altogether wrong, and even if I am, I have an unalienable human right to be wrong. But as of this writing, it seems it'll have I'll have to fall into agreement with most of the articulate world that the Negro March on Washington was one of history's greatest triumphs of the human spirit. That's a great encapsulation of this. And uh, this is essentially the same thing from Wiss. So the impact of the March on Washington, ratification of the 24th Amendment to the US Constitution, this was big because it allowed people to vote more freely, it, it took away the taxation and uh, created a lot more access, which was so important. And of course, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which effectively ended Jim Crow, it uh, just gave people a chance in, in writing at least to live as people. And of course, we're still working on that now, but this was a big step in that direction. 
So the connection between Wishsonatine and the March on Washington. Valerie Coleman's Wishsonatine is an aural depiction of the Middle Passage, one of the most horrifying and pivotal events in history, and it's juxtaposed by the March on Washington, one of the most glorious and pivotal events in history. The March on Washington would not have happened without the current of the Middle Passage, so they are indirectly linked in that way. And if we look at the range of humanity from what it took for people to decide they wanted to enslave Africans to people deciding that that was the furthest thing from eth ethical, you know, it shows all of humanity very, very well. And of course, both of these events display a trait that has been inherited by all black Americans, resilience. And so, with that in mind, we will play Wish Sonatine and dive into the emotions that were experienced by the Africans on the ship. This piece is quite powerful and dissonant, so be ready. <laughs>
about as easy to listen to as Mary Had a Little Lamb, right? <laughs> oh, um, sorry, thank you very much. So um, the last bit of this is just to get some um, final thoughts, or to get some final thoughts across and to maybe do some questions. So um, very important to realize this is not trauma porn. This is not meant to make any part of this any type of capitalization off of anybody's pain or just, just general suffering. This is contextualization. This is supposed to bring things into the 21st century, into now. So I hope you can take this with you knowing that this is life that, and that is about it, in all honesty. And the other thought is that, like with this presentation and with the way I've connected the music with these stories, everything is really connected it's really your willingness to see the threads that put everything together. So in your life, as you are going about, you know, if you're thinking about this or whatever else, you're not sure about why you're not able to connect with some people or why things are just wild and whatnot, um, you, they, they are linked anyway. It's, it's just uh, some people are more able or think they're more able to see things and some people haven't taken the time to. So remember that we are all Right here, right here. So, are there any questions of any kind? This is the end of the presentation, by the way. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, thank you. I saw your hand first. Uh, sorry, and uh, this is in the evening. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you. It's amazing for all that you're doing in the legacy of your um, grandfather. I just had a question. When did you start playing the flute? Sure. Um, I started playing in sixth grade with my band program, and I've been playing for 13 years now. So, exactly how long. Thank you. I can tell you, so this is your first time having put on this specific presentation, kind of what inspired you uh, to do that, and is there any particular reason why you chose to start back here? Great question. Um, so I decided to do this particular one with these stories because they are ones that I can personally connect with the most, and also because they are ones that directly translate to my grandfather's work, along with uh, just his, his newspaper in general. I was actually planning on doing something very similar to this in Memphis back in January, but pandemic. So that's been postponed until November, so uh, I'm just glad I got to share that with you. Here. Yeah. Um, so I know you pointed out that this is not trauma porn, which I also recognize. How do you, like, separate your own like personal trauma and emotions that come with these stories to understand and highlight the importance for others? Does that make sense? I think so. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. I've spent a lot of time just mulling over these stories and this history and my direct connection to them. And I've realized that this is all, like I mentioned the connection stuff, this is all part of life. And I have to embrace it for what it is it and to be able to share it with everybody around me because um, I, I think I'm the only person who can do this specifically and I'm very happy to because I realize its value and my grandfather's value and I'm uh, once again glad I got to share it with you uh, because it needs to be told. Other questions? My name is Veronica Brunson. I came in late. Is music, is music uh, therapeutic for you? Very. <laughs> it's totally necessary. necessary. Yeah, um, I started playing because I thought the flute was, I literally just thought it was cool. I, I saw somebody playing at a concert and said, that's what I'm doing next. And since then, it's become kind of my everything. I listen to music about 80% of my, and during 80% of my free time, and practicing all the time. And friends musically and it's uh, helped me become the person I am today so it's absolutely therapeutic for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
who wants to go up and show us? So in the two pieces you played, it seemed like the flute was somewhat the passive voice. So do instruments have like personalities? Is the piano always dominant? Is the flute always submissive in the storytelling? That's a great question too. Um, in, in this music, um, they're supposed to be relatively equal partners, but also they have the ability to, you know, flute can take the reins, piano can take the reins. There's a lot of trading back and forth. Jenny is an awesome collaborator, so we've had a lot of fun mulling over ideas to figure out how to make a, uh, come across the best that we can. And uh, in general, instruments have specific characters that they're often used for in orchestral writing, especially. But outside of that, instruments are really meant to be able to embody any, any emotion, any character, uh, time period, whatever you want. So, um, yeah, I mean, you, you heard a lot of different sounds come out of my flute today, and a lot of sounds come out of the piano, so the ultimate goal is to be able to present, uh, I, to use the word humanity again, all of humanity within our instruments. And I, and I want to add something, I mean, the flute is mostly a single line, and sort of a melodic instrument with a relatively high range. The piano has 88 keys, I have 10 fingers. I can play up to 12 notes, I think, or 13, <laughs> right, with those 10 fingers on a very broad range. So that might contribute to the fact that you heard just a lot more layering and texture. Remember when he was showing the score where the flute was one line at the top and then the rest of the thick stuff, the chords, is the piano also. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Do you want to do a little encore for them? Thank you.